Hey folks, Dakota Cohen here. Thanks for tuning into another one of our YouTube lives. Tonight we've got a special guest, Brian Goldstein from Zero Fox uh, uh, Tree Crops. Um, Brian and I met about three, four years ago. Yep. Um, I was doing some consulting in the, the Nelson area and we had a client who was looking at getting a bunch of uh, nut trees for their food forest and uh, happened to come across Brian's nursery and we had some really great chats and kind of kept in touch the last few years. Um, and yeah, every time we talk on the phone, Brian, after about an hour, I, be, I wish, man, I wish we would have recorded that because yeah. <laughs> I always just learned so much from you. Um, so yeah, finally just thrilled to be able to, to do a Q and A with you. Um, so yeah, basically the, the plan tonight folks is, Brian's got um, a great little presentation on uh, something he calls basically a, a dirt bag nursery, which is, you know, just quick and dirty, um, how you guys can start, you know, a, a bunch of your own, uh, um, uh, you know, fruit, nut trees, uh, biomass plants, how to propagate them. Uh, and of course, Brian is also um, a nurseryman himself. So he's he's got a fantastic website. Um, I'm actually going to pull that up right now. Uh, zerofoxtreecrops.com. The link is in the show notes below. Um, he's got um, a, a ton of plants you can get for, for this year. Everything from, you know, berries, nuts, biomass plants. Um, I've gotten stuff from you for three years now. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, some of those black locusts that we got a couple of years ago, they're still going strong. The mulberries look like they made it through last winter. Nice. And... Um, yeah. So uh, before we take, kick it off, I, I just want to let everyone know this we're, we're not affiliated with Brian. We're not getting any kickbacks. I just love this guy's stuff. He's a wealth of knowledge. And uh, I wanted to uh, our, our team here wanted to to bring him on and and let him share some of his wisdom. So with that, Brian, I'll kick it over to you and the presentation you got started here. Cool. Uh, thanks, Dakota. I'm really excited to be here. Um, yeah, you know, it's uh, the stuff you're doing is is pretty inspirational to to folks that are, you know, developing their homesteads. So um, yeah, I'm I'm pretty proud to to be on on with you guys and uh, share some stuff that I got prepared. Um, yeah, a little bit about my background. I uh, I'm from the states. I uh, I grew up in Colorado and uh, ended up on the western slope of Colorado for college uh, in a little town called Gunnison, and it's really cold there. And so we got into like high altitude uh, market um, gardening, just different vegetables that would, you know, do well in a cold climate and got a season extension. And, you know, it was really just kind of a, you know, a young person's, you know, hand tools and, uh, and a pipe dream sort of thing. And, um, you know, some harsh realities hit. It was, it was like the same work every year. You're not really making a ton of advancement, you know, even if you have your system set up, it's the same annual planting every year. So in comes permaculture and uh, perennial agriculture and agroforestry. And um, that stuff got me super excited, um, you know, seeing the real value of, of tree crops and um, all the different things they could offer and, and not have to do the same work every year. Right. Um, you know, it's a lot of upfront labor, um, but once you uh, kind of get into the harvest cycle of, of mature plants, it's it's amazing how much they can produce with such little maintenance that uh, it was really inspiring. And I kind of I got off the the organic veggie train and switched over to permaculture. Um, and yeah, where I was at was like a zone three, you know, minus forty five in the middle of the winter. And so kind of um, wanted to be in a little bit of a warmer spot and. Uh, a place with some mountains, but a, a decent growing condition. Um, so I found myself in uh, the Kootenays of uh, British Columbia and, uh, you know, landed here, uh, met my partner, uh, went through the whole sponsorship thing and uh, developed this nursery. So this was kind of a, a dream we had to um, figure out a way to, to be, you know, making our income from perennial crops without, you uh, owning land you know we we don't we still don't own land and uh everything we grow is on a lease parcel it's about an acre uh we got three young agrarians uh check them out uh they do really good land matching so yeah we're uh we're living the dream um and so you know the goal was to grow tree crops and you know get a bunch started for my eventual homestead 
um, help friends out with them and, and make a business out of it. And uh, I realized pretty quickly that uh, you can't just, you know, order these seeds on Amazon. Uh, you have to find the stuff yourself. And so, you know, we, we go through seed catalogs, you know, for, as vegetable growers every year and you kind of, you see all the, the funky varieties and you want to try everything. Um, and when it comes to perennial crops, they're just, they're not around the nurseries, especially in Canada are, are pretty limited. Um, and, and the plants are expensive. I mean, you know, you can, you can definitely get cheaper stuff and, and, you know, it's usually in plug form. Um, and then there's the really expensive stuff, which is, uh, uh, you know, potted up usually. Um, and it's, you know, who knows where it's grown. It was likely shipped to Canada, how it was grown. Um, I think this is an awareness that's going to be growing a lot is, uh, is just nursery practices and, and how toxic they can be. Um, and so I'm kind of learning that as we go and I'm like, well, there's gotta be these other ways. So, you know, um, I'm definitely not inventing the wheel here. I, uh, I learned a lot of this stuff and was inspired by, uh, guys like Akiva Silver, uh, Sean Dombrowski, um, you know, they're in the States in, uh, upstate New York, uh, pretty similar climate to where we're at. And I was just learning about these plants and seeing what they were growing and some of their techniques. And I was like, I, I can do that. Um but the crux was finding the plants. So what I'm here uh, to do tonight is kind of um, give you uh, some tips and tricks on, on how to do this yourself. Cause you know, developing your own homestead, it's going to take, you know, even if you're on a few acres or less, you know, that could be thousands of plants and uh, you probably don't have a budget to just buy every single plant. And even if you did, a lot of those plants are not from where you're from. And even though we're dealing with, you know, not necessarily native, plants, but, um, you know, plants that, you know, uh, uh, an English oak that works in Alabama might not work in Ontario. Right. Um, yeah. and, and that's really true of some of the, the, uh, heavy hitters like chestnuts, um, different berry crops. And so, you know, my eyes started opening up once I realized I could just order, you know, a Canadian grown chestnut seed or hazelnut seed. And it's like, well, where do you get this stuff? And it's like, you got to go find it. So, um, yeah, we're going to break down kind of, um, some, some ideas that I've, I've been developing for, you know, finding species and, um, and then what to do with their seeds or cuttings and, uh, some pretty simple ways to get, uh, their genetics growing, um, in the home nursery so that you can populate your land, you know, with a bunch of, uh, bunch of plant life. Um, and this really ties into what you're doing to Dakota because, uh, you know, if you're going down this entropic agroforestry route that's not just a normal amount of plant, you know, that you need to install there. That's, that's exponentially more. Right. And it's never done. You're always adding into the, into the fold and, you know, adding plants and taking plants out um, and just kind of, you know, turbo boosting those organic cycling, um, you know, whether it be from like the material it's in or the succession level that you're at. Yeah. So, it, it, it adds up and uh, you're going to need to grow a lot of your own plants. And the, the thing is not only will you save money is you'll end up, you know, figuring out the regional plants that grow around you and, and find things that are best suited for your property. Um, yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's really exciting what you're doing to see how densely you're planting stuff yeah. uh, and how you're getting away with it. Right. I mean, people put things at, you know, 25 foot spacing sometimes and, um, you know, when I talk to customers and I'm like, they're like, well, what's the spacing on this? I'm like, well, it depends on what you're trying to do, but yeah. you know, hazelnut bushes, can you plant it a, a meter apart if you want? Um, and part of this is that, you know, the centropic effect of, of so many plants in one space and, and, you know, coppicing things and, and, you know, chop and drop and all the different things you can do to, you know, catalyze these life cycles. But it's also just a, a function of mass selection. I mean, when we put things in the landscape, it's, it's not a guarantee that it's going to work out, right? Like, you know, there's some dependable plants, but within that the cultivars are uh, highly variable. And I think that's the exciting thing about a lot of these perennial crops. And that's like the frustrating thing is you don't know what kind of apple you're going to get out of a seed. Um, and, you know, when you just have one spot for the perfect apple tree, uh, you know, you tend to think seedlings are a, a dying cause. Right. And, uh, I guess our approach here is kind of just throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Um, and you're doing your own breeding projects and, and your, your property will be more resilient in the long term for it. Yeah, absolutely. 
And, and that's one thing I want to I want to stress there, um, Brian is is like even if um, like the the biggest reason why uh, I'm 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 starting my own seeds and stuff, you know, and, and have been experimenting with that over the years. It's not so much for the cost effectiveness. It's it's for um, being able to get these uh, starting to develop our own genetics that are adapted to our, our particular bioregions. Right. Um, so I, I I really think because um, your stuff actually is uh, you know qu quite affordable for the the quality that you're you're getting. Um, but that was my strategy, you know, in buying from all these different nurseries, you know, with this particular uh, planting that I did last year. Um, you know, at, at my new property here is, is this is essentially my, my laboratory or my, uh, my own propagation nursery that I'm gathering plant material from, you know, as many different nurseries as I can, you know, yours included to, to see what sticks. Um, and so in addition to, you know, the syntropic planting style, which is, you know, you're, a, a lot of these plants that I'm putting at, you know, trees that are, could be spaced 25 feet apart that I'm putting at a foot. Part of that is because I'm going to be managing them and coppicing them out. But the other approach is, um, like you said, a lot of them are going to die or they're not going to thrive as well. And so um, I'm trying to roll that dice as, you know, as, as put as many dice in, the, in my hand as possible to roll it to see how many kind of sixes I can get. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, even if people are, you know, really looking at starting their own nurseries, like you, you've got to start by giving some kind of plant or propagation material. And that's why I love what you're doing is you can even, I think you're starting to sell seeds now. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to, uh, switch to just doing seeds in the fall and then okay. the trees in spring. Cause it's, it's kind of too much at once, but, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes it's like, you know, what you figure out is that whether I collect 80 you know, seeds from a tree or 800. It's yeah. a similar amount of work. Uh, so it's kind of like, you know, we should supply people with the opportunity to do it themselves. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. A lot of our, our seeds are sold out for this year, but um, we'll have a bunch in the fall. And okay. it's kind of, yeah, just whatever interesting thing I found that year that I had enough of to share that I thought might be valuable. Um, so that'll be out there. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's let's dig into your presentation. And if, if folks have questions as we're going along, please do throw them up in the chat. Um, uh, and uh, there'll be time at the end where we'll, we'll go through some of those. So, yeah, cool. dive into it. All right, well, um, I mean, the start of you know growing plants in your own nursery is just identifying plants in your area. So, you know, the visual slides um, are up there where we'll, we'll talk about some of these characteristics to look for. Um, and then there's just a community based approach as well. So there's kind of two different things. So let's start, um, you know, with finding genetics and plant identification and, um, you know, it's seasonal, um, and every season has its merit for when you should be looking for plants. Um, obviously during the growing season, uh, you know, when leaves and flowers are out, it's spring and, uh, and you're like, oh, I was always wondering what tree that was and you're like hey that is an oak tree um great and you make yeah. a mental note of it right and you're just identifying things that you might already be aware of so kind of like the the baseline you know identification stuff um but the slides i put in uh or the picture that i put on this slide was for some of the harder times like winter is a really good time for uh, finding useful plants around but you got to be familiar with things like bark and buds um you can see mm -hmm. on the right um uh, uh, over the, the little buds of that's a that's an oak tree um and then you know persisting characteristics so the the picture on the bottom there in the center is a is a hackberry uh the sugarberry tree and you can kind of see that the fruits are still on the tree so you know it definitely takes some experience getting used to i mean even the silhouette of a, an oak tree you know five years ago i would you know just drove by it and now i'm like that's an oak tree you know we'll be with the kids and just be like hey did you see that oak and they're like what are you talking about <laughs> it, just, it pops out um yeah so you know whether the tree is valuable to you in the moment or not just like you know really getting up close and inspecting buds and bark you know during the growing season the leaves the flowers um and then also you know thinking about um you know is it an appropriate plant for me is it loaded with fruit right um is it is it having these big harvest years well is it every year? Is, are there some big off years? Um, you know, don't just assume that because there's no nuts on the ground doesn't mean that there won't be next year. A lot of these trees evolve like that, right? So yeah, yeah. it's yeah. observation seasonally and annually, right? Like you, you'll have to watch trees for years sometimes to figure out that they're just 
you know, kind of some masterpiece of genetics that you got to have. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are, those are definitely things to look uh, for when you're, when you're looking for stuff, uh, places to do this. Um, and this, like I said, you know, I'm not coming from a generational nursery where we just have, you know, all of our stuff growing and we collect our stuff on sites. Like now I'm, I'm out in a, you know, a country that I'm not from um, in an area that's new to me. I got to figure this stuff out. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just kind of like the on the ground techniques, um, you know, town parks are really good. Uh, recreational fields. I mean, boulevard plantings uh, in Nelson, right? There's a whole row. I'm, like the first yeah. acorns I ever collected were these red oaks. And I realized it's like, wait, every tree on this boulevard is red oak. This is amazing. And then I had a guy come up to me and tell me that like, Hey, this, these red oaks are from like the red square in Moscow. And I mean, grand salt. Right. But there's stories attached to these, these totally. trees. Yeah, people yeah. come out of the woodworks to just tell you about them. Yeah. Um, other great places are graveyards. Um, there's often super epic trees. Yeah. 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 Graveyards. Um, <laughs> yeah um, we go well, I mean, well fertilized. <laughs> yeah, totally. Right? Ghosts in the seed, right? Um, I go on like seed finding vacations that aren't uh, officially seed finding vacations to the rest of my family, but like yeah. when I'm back in Ontario visiting the in laws, like I'll just be wandering through conservation areas. I mean, look at all these hickory trees, and you know, you find stuff. Um, arboretums are another good spot. Um, you you yeah. gotta make sure that you're you're acting appropriately, and if you're allowed to take stuff. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of contacting people. I've rarely had anyone be like, no, you can't take that. But it's nice to ask for permission um, rather than explain yourself after the fact. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you know, look to see if there's an arboretum in your area. Contact the director and say, hey, you know, you have an interesting linden tree. Could I collect some seeds off of it? As long as it's not damaging anything, um, you know, it yeah. should be pretty kosher. Um, yeah, you know, old neighborhoods are really good. Um, place to find genetics, uh, you know, uphill Nelson, uh, BC is, is, is an epic spot for finding trees in this, you know, town. It's not, you know, European old, but it's, it's been around for a century of, of domestication. And so, you know, immigrants bring their trees with them, uh, in the Kootenays, right. A lot of the epic walnuts around here are from the Duke Wars. So mm -hmm. you kind of, you, you see these trees and you're like, what's that? And then you talk to an owner and they're like, oh yeah, this tree's been here you know since we lived here and we've owned the property for 60 years you're like, oh my god this is special so um you know kind of putting yourself in the area where they might be is a really good thing to do um just kind of always being on the lookout you know just casually when you're driving around uh black the trees uh had a hard time losing their leaves um because we had such a late growing season and then an early frost and that was a perfect way to key out oaks um, cause the oaks just did not lose their leaves. So you could just be driving down the highway going on hundred K and spot a tree just loaded with brown leaves. And you're like, that's probably an oak and lo and behold, you know, there you go. So, um, that's just, you know, different strategies for finding plants just kind of while you're out in the world. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's always fun to just go on the treasure hunt, see what you'll find. Um, I've had some weird, like, uh, you know, it feels like acts of God, like, you know, finding plants where it was like, oh, this non-king cherry appeared out of nowhere. How did that happen? And it's, it's kind of that law of attraction. Like if you're looking for the things, they will show themselves. Yeah. Um, and so then the other methods for, um, you know, finding genetics on a social level is, you know, the internet's a really powerful tool and people love talking about plants, even if they don't know the name of it, they're just like, I don't know what it is. This thing rains down, you know, this type of fruit and you're like, Oh yeah, did you take a picture and you find out you're like, Oh my God, that's a persimmon. Um, there's different social apps, uh, that are like made for this. So I naturalist is one. Um, if you ever in any place, you can just bring up I naturalist, um, and it'll give you like a map layout and you can look at all the different species that are in that area. And it's super beneficial. Right. Um, I, I've, I've found different, you know, uh, especially when I'm back East and I, I know nothing about the area. It's like, Oh, cool. There's like a bunch of hickories over here. Like, all right, let's look at all of Canada and find out, you know, where the, you know, native pawpaws are. Um, cool. This is, is definitely a super cool tool uh, to use and contribute to, right? Cause like, as you make observations, you're just kind of contributing to the community. Um, and so, you know, if you want to keep it private, I get it, but putting that out there for other, you know, collectors, or just people that just want to see this stuff. Um, and there's no, uh, it's not just native plants. It's not just exotic plants. 
I mean, there's insects on there. It's it's everything. So oh. Naturalist is a cool one. Um, let's see. I have a little list that I made because that's the main social app that I use for like finding random plants. Yeah. Uh, but there's another one. This is a, there's a seed trading app called Squirrel. And uh, you spell it with two I's and two R's. And it just started. But basically, people get on there with seeds they have for sale um, and seeds they're looking for. You can make requests. So definitely want to plug that out because, uh, yeah, the creators seem like pretty humble people and um, it seems like a good thing. Uh, other apps that I looked up that were similar to iNaturalist were Seek, PlantNet, and NatureGate. I have no experience with those, but I'm sure it's a similar platform where you can just look at pins on a map and, you know, figure out, you know, you can just type in the word, you know, genus Castanea and see if anything comes up. And if it does, it's, yeah, go to the go to the pin on the map, knock on a door. Um, and that's, you know, that's a good segue into to what it takes to get, to get access to a lot of these genetics is just putting yourself out there and, and, you know, kind of asking, um, you know, like asking a homeowner be like, Hey, um, I saw this tree from the street is, uh, does it have any fruit on it? Could I come get some seed? And, and people are usually pretty excited to share. Um, yeah. they'll end up telling you about like, four more trees in their neighborhood that you should go check out. <laughs> so, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Let's see. Yeah. I mean, that's a good segue into collection now. So when you do go collecting, I mean, there's so many different techniques for uh, collecting from plants, but a lot of it is just time handpicking, right? You guys aren't going to be on the scale I'm at. So, you know, getting, um, you know, a quick handful of seeds can get you really far. Um, I learned pretty quick that you want to get more than you think you need in a sense that because the germination rates aren't the same as vegetables, um, you might lose some to, um, you know, rodents or they don't stratify properly. So it's nice to get a little bit more than you need. If you end up with everything being viable, then you'll have trees to give away. Um, and that's always a good thing too. So get a bucket, um, get your hands dirty, get in there. Um, you know, for the more mature trees, like I found, uh, in Ontario, like when I was walking in these conservation areas, the trees were so big that I couldn't even identify them if I wasn't able to identify the bark. And then, okay, you identify them, but they're the lowest part of their canopy is like 40 feet up. So, um, yeah, some techniques that I've been learning about is like uh, lassoing branches. So it's like you can throw a rope up and lasso a branch and then shake it. You know, as long as it doesn't hurt the tree, it can drop down mm. a bunch of seed. And then you're you know, picking out these little seeds from the ground. And people think, of, like, what is that guy doing? Um, you'll definitely get that feedback when you're just kind of collecting from some random specimen wherever you are. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different tricks. It's just kind of limited to your creativity. So um, yeah, you know, find, find the trees and then go out and collect them. And it's all seasonal. I mean, if you know a plant is, is going to have, you know, genetic material available, it might not in the next day or the next week. So be opportunistic. If you, if you're there and it has seed, get some because stuff disappears so quickly. Um, I've had that with plums where I'm like driving by, I'm like, ah, I don't have time right now. And then you turn, come back two days later and a bear showed up and just demolished the tree. And you're not growing those plums this year. So yeah. Uh, yeah, there's nature doesn't wait for sure. Cool. Um, yeah. You know, when you're thinking about different, um, things to look for, um, when it comes to like regionally adapted stuff, um, yeah, the, the yield that it's going to throw out is definitely, you know, if, uh, those are the biggest apple trees I've ever seen or like, wow, that plum bush is so loaded. Yeah. Um, there's other things to think about, you know, if you see, um, you know, there's, there's the birch in this area are just getting hammered by uh, the leaf miner. And, you know, once in a while you'll see a tree that just has no bug damage and every other tree around it does, you know, so looking for things like that, you know, even if it has a moderate yield of whatever crop you're looking for, if it has high disease resistance or pest resistance, you know, it's better, it's better to have a living tree than a dead, you know, perfect tree, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, you know, vigor is one. Um, if you see something that's growing super fast, um, precociousness, uh, fancy word for just early um, fruit or nut set, um, mm -hmm. produce at a young age. Um, and that can be good and that can be bad because often things that are bred to be precocious have a short life cycle. So, yeah. you know, if it's just something that's going to come into the system and leaves somewhat soon, that works. But if you're looking for kind of a long, you know, 
fixture on your property. Um, this is why I kind of warn people against dwarf fruiting trees is because they're made to be pretty finite. Um, they can produce like crazy, but you know, because they're so precocious, they, they kick the bucket a lot quicker. Um, so things to consider and then age. I mean, if you find some super old Epic tree, um, yeah. and especially like here, you know, I think about cold hardiness and, you know, the region we're in, it's just like, well, you know, how cold does it get there? And it's like, well, how cold has it gotten in the last 80 years? Cause that's all the tree is. So it's seen. Yeah. Some shit. So that's, that's kind of the, you know, it's nice to collect from the, the veteran trees. Um, yeah. Do you think forestry practices, right? They leave the big trees or they're supposed to leave the big trees just as mother trees for spreading their seed. Cause there's, you know, such epic genetics that um, they should continue putting their stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah. Are, Brent, are there any, um, do, do you have any uh, companies that, that, that have really good um, tree, uh, tree seeds that you've, that you buy some, you, that you buy from reliably that, that you can get from, you know, the right growing zone? Yeah, um, there's a few. I mean, we super limit what we buy just because, you know, yeah. I'm cheap. I, I want to, you know, not have to mark trees up. This is how we keep our prices low. But if it's something that I just can't find and I'm like, I want to grow Viburnum lentago, right? The nanny berry. And there's just no bushes around here. Um, you know, it's uh, FW Schumacher in the States is a good one. Uh, you can tell they're good because their website is super old school. HTML, <laughs> it's like probably two old guys running that company for the last four years and someone forced them to go online um, or like, you know, away from the catalog. And uh, another good one, I mean, Sheffield's is, is a big one in the States. Um, you know, they they can get a lot of different trees and availability just, you know, varies. You might be like, ah, oh, you know, I held off on buying that sugar maple seed for a while. And then you go back and it's out of stock and it's out of stock for the next three years. So, you know, yeah. if you see a seed availability and it's, it's in stock and you're just like, well, I'm not going to be able to find that stuff, buy it up. Um, Cause it's not guaranteed that they'll have it again. Um, and really the other thing is just trading with people. I mean, there's, there's several other growers, um, that are doing what I'm doing. I, you know, I can think of uh, uh, Blackbird Hollow um, is is a good one. Um, Oak Summit Nursery, right? It's just other small growers, and you know where we have access to a bunch of epic hazelnut seed. And you know, I feel like it's not that special anymore because I can get so much of it. They're like, oh my god, you can get hazelnuts. Like, do you want you know this? And I'm like, I we have no hickories producing within a you know. 10 hours, you know, 20 hours of me. Yeah. I'll take it for every hickory seed you got. So, you know, figuring, figuring out other people who have access to stuff. Um, and I think that's kind of what that squirrel app might be good for is, is kind of making a community out of that. Um, but yeah, those are the two seed companies that I can think of. Um, incredible seeds is one. Um, I really ordered from them that much. Uh, they're pretty pricey, but they have really good, uh, permaculture type plants. So, uh, they're worth checking out. Um, yeah, so, you know, we talked about collecting genetics, um, and what to look for when you're collecting them. Um, now what do you do, right? Cause the, the process is definitely not over. Um, once you find your seed, um, these aren't like vegetable seeds. They don't just germinate readily. They have these, you know, evolutionary mechanisms built in to keep them from germinating, um, so that they pop up at the right time. And, um, Man, is it frustrating? Um, you know, you think you uh, you think you're doing the right thing, and you plan out a bed, and then you get to see if they come up, and they don't come up, and it's not like, all right, I'll just buy another seed packet of that. It's like you're gonna have to wait another year. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely some trial and error stuff there, but um, you know, we we can talk a bit about the the mechanisms to overcome. Um, when you get the seed, um, it's pretty important to clean it. Um, there are some things that you can just kind of mash up and throw in the soil. But a lot of these, uh, you know, fruits and nuts need to be processed um, for them to germinate at all. Um, the pictures in this slide uh, are non-king cherry. So you can imagine if I just sowed like non-king cherry fruits in a bed, they would never co like, come up because they basically evolved to, to not germinate if their flesh is surrounding them still. So they, they want to be out of that probably through the digestion system of an animal um, yeah, yeah. on their side. Um, you know, you can go find bear poop in the Kootenays and, uh, 
and then put it in like an airproof bed and see if anything comes up. That might be a way to get huckleberry germinating, but uh, you're not going to be able to do that for everything. So uh, cleaning your seeds is important. And um, yeah, the, the matrix I've learned how to do this, um, you know, they make really expensive machines that do this stuff. And uh, you know, it's, it's pretty much as simple as getting a paint mixer and uh, beating the heck out of the seeds called the maceration. Um, and, and that's if it's a strong seed. So with these non-king cherries, you can kind of see the bucket there. And then I got uh, the paint mixer on the drill. It's nice to have a corded drill um, cause it would take up a lot of batteries from your battery power drill. But um, yeah, you basically just uh, mix them up in a little bit of water. Um, it depends on the seed uh, or the fruit that, you know, how much water do you add? Um, but as long as it's gyrating in there and you know, mashing off the flesh and leaving the seed intact, um, I've definitely found out the hard way that like the, some metal paint mixtures will destroy seeds when you go to um, clean them. So I found like, uh, I, I forget if it, I think it's for latex paint or something, but it's like a, it's a rubber end to the paint mixer. And that's way more gentle on seeds, but not strong enough for walnuts, right? So, you know, having a couple different paint mixers uh, in your in your stash, um, you know, and then they're multi-purpose, right? Maybe you need to mix some paint someday. But um, yeah, you, ma you, you macerate the seeds and then it's just a process of decanting. So in the picture on the left, um, you can see I'm pouring off um, the pulp and a lot of seeds, especially like any members of the prunus family, um, apples are really easy to do. You know, it's, you're just macerating the seeds, get the flesh off of them. And then you kind of mix them up with your hand and then pour off the flesh as the seeds settle and the, the pulp will still float. And, you know, this isn't a one or two off. This is like sometimes 25 pourings, right? So, you know, get your hose out. Uh, you're going to get wet. It's, you know, I do it. I try to do it over a compost pile or something like that. Um, if I'm not sure if I'm going to lose seeds, I'll pour them off and catch them in a strainer. And like, you know, Saskatoon's are a really good example of that where the seeds are really small. So if you, you pour too, too much, all of a sudden you lost a bunch of seeds. Well, if you're pouring that off into a strainer, then you can try it again. Um, but you'll, you'll see that the, you know, you, you add some, it's super cloudy. You pour off what you can, you add more water and eventually it becomes clear. Like you can see, um, in that picture. Um, and, uh, and then you're just left with this beautiful pile of clean seed. And then, then you have some seed now what, and, uh, you know, one of the big mistakes I made, um, in the beginning was, um, drying seeds. Like I didn't know that, um, basically with a lot of them, they'll develop a really hard seed coat when they dry out. And then that either makes them not viable or they won't germinate for a couple of years. Uh, plums are like this, um, or at least some of the species, um, you know, cherries. And you want to, you know, fresh seed is good. You can get away with dried seeds, like mulberries germinate pretty reliably from dried seed. Um, it really depends. Um, but overall, it's nice to have fresh seed and it's nice to fall plant. Um, so in these pictures, you can see how I store the seeds. Um, and that's like my seed pit. Um, you know, we used a root cellar this year that was pretty nice because I could just access it easily in the middle of the winter to, to pack seed orders or whatever, check on seeds. But um, for the last four years, we've just been, you know, it's a big pile of wood chips and then um, you have to bury them in there. And if you leave them exposed, the rodents will eat them, almost guaranteed. So you can see this, uh, this crate here is just packed with sand and seeds. Uh, the top closes, but the bottom is kind of a, a mesh grid. Um, that would keep rodents from tunneling in and getting it, but allows like a flow through system. So, you know, I've had a few issues with mold over the years with certain seed lots, but for the most part, you know, as long as it's uh, well draining and, you know, there's, you know, aeration to a point, um, it basically meets the perfect stratification requirements that they need. Um, and that's what we can kind of talk about now is uh, the stratification for uh, perennial seeds. Um, we'll get to cuttings in a second, but, um, yeah, so stratification is basically a built-in mechanism of a seed to, uh, germinate at the right time. And there is warm stratification and there's cold stratification. Warm stratification is for, uh, embryonic development. So, um, you know, a lot of the prunus family will, you know, become ripe in August, right? And so I'll clean it and store it, um, in some packed sand like that. But it's at um, ambient air temperature or like, you know, the, the average air temp or 
temperature of the wood chips. And basically what that's doing is it thinks that it fell from the tree, got cleaned through an animal's digestive tract or whatever, and then ended up in some soil. And so it's like, cool, this is totally good. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. You're just mimicking that, but protecting it from uh, pest and then putting it in a place where you can retrieve it and then put it where you want to when you go for its final planting. So um, there's resources that will tell you. Um, and it's funny, a lot of it's anecdotal. I mean, there's good research on a lot of species, but other species are just like, hey, a grower in Illinois stratified for 90 days at 38 degrees and they got 70%. A different girl didn't stratify at all and got 100%. We don't know why. <laughs> so you're like, Jeez. okay, <laughs> anecdotal evidence is good enough. But um, the Dur manual, that's D I R R, um, I think his first name is Michael. Um, that's a pretty common um, seed manual for woody plant propagation. And he has a lot of inf information in there. Um, and that's, that's the book I'm kind of referring to where it's some of it's anecdotal, some of it's uh, research-based, but it should tell you, um, you know, what it takes for cuttings, what it takes for seed stratification requirements so that, you know, you're like, Hey, I want to grow elderberry from seed. You can kind of reference that manual and then look it up. Um, someone gifted me one of these manuals from like the seventies and it's crazy how much different information is in there. Um, and some of it's proved to be really useful. That wasn't, yeah, that's the exact manual. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's pretty comprehensive, but it doesn't have everything. The other little green book kind of in the frequently bought together. Yeah. That's a, uh, that's a really nice book. Um, it was written by this, this guy who died before it was published and then his uh, family and friends put it together and, and put it out there. Um, and it's a lot of just raw information. Um, you know, a lot of it's from his notes. And he gets, he gets pretty real with uh, what it takes. He's pretty bare bones himself. You know, he'll talk about growing in community pots um, so that you get, you know, get 30 seedlings up in one batch. And um, it's mm -hmm. not high tech at all. So um, those two books are, are really worth, are worth uh, investing in. Um, and then you have just a, re a reference place for, for how long to stratify. So yeah, we'll basically store our seeds and, um, you know, I, like I said before, uh, fall planting is great if you can, but the problem with fall planting is that, you know, if you put a chestnut in its, its nursery bed in October, um, it's probably going to get dug up and eaten if you're in a place with a lot of squirrels. Yeah. So what do you do? And, um, I think on our last slide, it's kind of not totally in order, but it's the very last slide. Number 13, there is a shot of, yeah, those white round things. Those are actually all buckets buried in the wood chips. And it's literally just a five gallon bucket drilled with holes um, on the top and the bottom, and then just packed with nuts. And the ratio is about 50-50 sand to nuts. Um, yeah, yeah so. this, this is something, you, you gave me this tip last year and I, did, um, I didn't have any sand, but I used peat moss 50-50. Sure. So I'll, I'll let you know how that works. Yeah. Yeah. It should be good. I mean, sand's cheap and free, but it's also really heavy. If you want to get jacked, you're carrying those buckets around. <laughs> wow. Fun thing to do. <laughs> so I've had pretty good results with those. Um, you can definitely add too much seed and it's kind of like, you know, hazelnuts, no doubt they'll always be fine. Too many chestnuts, uh, you know, you can have mold issues. Um, okay. so it's kind of, you know, play around with it, but it's nice. I mean, you can do just a bucket packed with sand. And then I have these little mesh bags for small batches of seed. Um, Cause not everybody needs 900 hazelnuts, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can kind of pack it all in the sand bucket, but instead of just dumping it all out and being like, well, there's little seeds everywhere. Um, they're in these little, I think they're called organa bags, um, just little mesh bags okay. um, that you might've seen in that slide that we were looking at with the seed pit. This one? Kind of see. No, it's uh, number five. Oh, yeah. these guys. Yeah, you see the little green bag. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just a breathable mesh bag that kind yeah. of sits at the top. So with with um, the, the different kind of stratification or even like scarification or the, you know, having to let things ferment, um, like because I know there's a bunch of different strategies and you said there's warm and cold. Have you noticed any like general patterns between that, that might help people. Um, cause essentially the, like whatever the, 
However, the seed evolved in nature, that's what you have to mimic in order to get it to germinate. And so, for example, like le a lot of um, like legume seeds, like carragana or honey locust or black black locust, stuff like that. These are really pioneer species that are typically established in really you know dry kind of dry climates where there's where um, there's not a lot of soil in the ecosystem. And so, like one of those patterns I know is you know if you pour almost boiling water on them that helps to melt the waxy coating that was yeah. designed to uh, basically make sure that that those seeds didn't germinate unless it was a really, really wet year so that they got a good leg up. Are there any other yeah. patterns that you've noticed? That, like are all nut trees almost all the same or all, you know, fruit trees almost all the same or all berries almost all the same or even for hardwood or softwood cuttings? Is there any like rhyme or reason to it or is it really that you just got to buy one of these manuals and and get specific? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, definitely if you can like put together ecological intuition, you'll figure it out. Yeah. I mean, all there's a floodplain species. So when you go to sow it, it makes sense to just sow it on the surface because mm -hmm. that's how the seed is distributed, right? It doesn't get buried. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, nuts, right? They're cached by animals. So you, yeah. you do bury those things. And yeah, um, yeah like you were saying with the, the woody legumes, uh, yeah, you know, scarification is is definitely necessary. Um, you know, yeah. uh, there's a funny one, uh, Kentucky coffee tree. Yeah. It was it was uh, the favorite food of like mastodons or something like that. <laughs> and so it requires yeah. serious like scarification to yeah. the point where like boiling water doesn't do the trick. I took out like uh, the metal cutting blade on my circular saw and was just like grabbing seeds with pliers and holding them up to the circular oh, saw. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I've, and, I've tried to do that too. It's dangerous. Holy shit. Yeah. And that's, um, in that green book that we were talking about, um, I think growing trees from seed or whatever, um, yeah. he uses the grit bag a lot. Um, and so the grit bag is just a way to macerate off the flesh. Um, but it's basically just, uh, it could be a Ziploc bag filled with sand or coarse gravel and you're just in there just rubbing the bag and that's going to clean off the flesh, but right. also car fire. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I've, yeah. I've heard I've heard other people use almost like uh, like rock polishers, like sure. thing, you put stuff in with sand yeah. and then turn it on for you know days yeah. to make really smooth things. Yeah. Totally, there's there's one PDF online that says that it was from like the North Dakota Ag Extension or something. So I got a rock polisher for the kids for Christmas, right? <laughs> um, Business expense. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and uh, yeah, I think for, especially for. Um, sensitive seeds that are going to get destroyed by anything else. It's like, you can put them in the rock polisher. Um, they'll, it's a lot more gentle, but it just takes like, it can take 20 days. Right. Um, but that'll scarify the heck out of it and clean all the pulp off of it for sure. Just a, a level of patience. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's, that's pretty good um, overview on scarification. I mean, look these things up. Uh, there's, there's pretty like good explanations online um and and species specific um if it says 90 days check on your seed after 60 sometimes they germinate anyways yeah. um and you're getting you know years ahead right like finally i've been on point to you know the linden seed i collect this year it's doubly dormant there's no way around that like i'm not messing around with hydrochloric acid to break down seed coat to skip a year oh, like, i'm just gonna collect two years in advance and then collect every year and i have one bag that does its warm stratification all summer in a protected place that I'm just, I don't even plant them, right? They're just out there in their, in their seed pit. And then I'm growing the linden from two years prior to that. And then, you know, that crop goes out. The next seed batch that's been sitting around for a year goes in. I collect that fall knowing that it's not going to come up next year, but the year after. So, you know, having that foresight um, and a doubly dormant stuff is like linden and uh, there's a bunch of medlar is like that. So, um, sure. And it's, it's a survival mechanism, right? It's just like, you know, we're going to go down and we're not going to come up for two years so that the animals that prey on us are, aren't going to just feast on new seedlings every year, going to change it up. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely those like intuitive ecological patterns that you can kind of, you know, yeah. like, like figure out what it's going to take. Um, but yeah, just try to mimic, you know, if the, if the seed falls in, um, I mean, maples are a good example of this. There's spring seeded maples where you can collect the seed plant that same year and you're going to get a little baby maple that same year right yeah. um mulberries start producing in june if you collect the seed in june and plant it they'll come up 
uh, they'll come up and be like that tall. Right. Um, but it's not always just that thought process. Cause like a lot of the plums will come up or, you know, drop in July and they need the ripening period of, uh, the warm stratification for the rest of the summer. Um, right. if you were to just collect them and throw them in a refrigerator, it wouldn't get to that point of embryonic development. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's kind of where the manual is helpful. Um, yeah. It's all online. Yeah. Right? yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I think the next slide is going to discuss cuttings. Yeah. So cuttings are a great way. Um, you know, we don't do only seedlings. Um, we're getting into a lot of cuttings. We're going to graft a bunch of stuff this year. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who do grafted stuff. I get why, because there's just these special cultivars that were seedlings, right, at one point. Uh, remember um but yeah to do clonal propagation with hardwood cuttings is a really easy way to get a known plant um and you can do it at, at a huge scale so uh the picture on the right is uh, i just took this picture this afternoon that's our uh, bottom heat propagation bed for hardwood cuttings and you can just see how many you can stuff in that beds i think four by eight um and it it's you know there's a couple thousand cuttings in there and you don't even have to put them in in individually you can put them in clusters and have them root out and then you you know pick them apart and try to be gentle wow. um, cool. and so you know for the agroforestry crops that are good for this it's often berries um because the berries will layer and we're not going to talk about layering today um that's more of like a nursery technique rather than what you need on the homestead but just imagine a you know a live bush a branch gets laid to the ground by snow some dirt gets kicked over it that branch can shoot roots off um, so it's the same type of, uh, you know, logic with cuttings, right? It contains cells that can produce roots just on its vegetative material. Um, and softwood cuttings are a whole thing on to their own. Um, I didn't really add any pictures to that, but because it, it involves misting and timers, um, yeah. stuff that you don't necessarily need to do, um, you know, on the homestead level, but the hardwood cuttings are really nice. Live staking works. Um, I know, Dakota, you have a bunch of experience with Poplar doing this stuff. Um, yeah, sadly, it's been pretty pretty hit or miss. Like, I, I put a bunch of stuff in last year. Yeah. That, like, I literally, like, cut that that spring, put a little bit of root, rooting hormone on, and just yeah. drilled in, like, probably a thousand of them just to see what would work. Right. And, yeah, the survival was – and, like, this is in – this is these were in beds that were irrigated. Like, they were yeah. very well looked after. Right. And – the ones that survived, they had as much growth as the rooted cuttings I paid, you know, two dollars two dollars for. Right. But the this yeah the the survival rate was um, pretty low. Yeah. Now I, I'm wondering if that was because I I cut them a bit late in the spring and so they were already starting to break dormancy. Right. I also had to let them sit around for a bit. So there there may have been um, a bit in there. I'm going to keep experimenting with that. But yeah, every every time I think I can just like throw some stuff into the ground and think that it'll miraculously take off. Yeah. No, it's, it's more complex than that. And yeah. Uh, totally. yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, it's funny cause there's, it's, it could be something as simple as seasonal timing. So yeah. you do everything the same, but you just cut two weeks earlier. And that might, that, that's my gut is that's what it was is I, I, I cut a bit too late and I didn't keep them. Um, I, I did keep them in my root cellar. Um, sure. But yeah, it was just, I don't know. I've, and I've, I've tried probably five or six times on yeah. like in different, different diameters. Um, and, and like, this is the first year I've ever actually purchased rooting hormone right. and, and dipped them in that. But um, yeah, yeah, still, still was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty disappointed with, uh, with the success rate. So this is, this is why I'm, I'm such a big fan of, of guys like you who are, who are <laughs> you know, doing all these things. Cause it, it you know, if if it, it takes years to to experiment with all this stuff to yeah to get it, to get it down pat um, for sure you only yeah. get one try a year and yeah that's, I mean the beginning to start with it's like how simple and easy and lazy can I be about this and if it works then don't use the you know rooting hormone or the bottom heat propagation bed um, it's just not worth it right it works anyways. And when it doesn't work, you're like, all right, I'll, maybe I'll try that one thing. And it, it could have been the case where you took the cuttings at a fine time. And if you had just thrown them in a, a callusing bed with a little bit of bottom heat so that the bottom of the cutting just calluses a bit, and then you go out and live stake them. Yeah. Well, what if that switches to 90% of 
um, yeah. to a grade. Yeah, so. and I and I, I do want to experiment with more with that because, like, like I said, some of the, especially for stuff like cuttings, uh, where you know in our, um, you know, in the, in the Syntropic Food Forest Manual, which we've done other um, live streams on before, yeah. you know, I'm I'm planting some of these support species in some cases, like you know, twelve inches to six inches apart, right? Uh, and so you know, it, it that can get expensive even when you're buying um, bulk stuff from, say, a place like Tree Time for. Yeah. You know two bucks a tree but again I, i'm i'm still at the place where i i haven't got reliable enough um uh results from doing this kind of put shit in the ground and hope that it works yeah but i'm gonna keep trying <laughs> yeah yeah i hear you and i mean the goal with all this stuff right is to scale it right yes we're trying to change food systems and yeah. and so what works in the backyard um, you know, it's, it's the thousand dollar tomato paradigm, right? It's like, yeah. well, you, you grew the best tomatoes ever, but you added, you know, on all these bags of compost and you had this fancy irrigation, so whatever it is, we got to make this stuff, you know, pretty simple and approachable at scale. So, and people should really think about that for their homestead, right? It's like they're, they're experimenting with different propagation techniques and they're hoping to expand it out. Because if it works simply and doesn't take up a lot of their time or resources, yeah. they can actually, you know, plant that back 40 with, with what they want. So yeah. Uh, yeah. that's, you know, that's kind of the impetus, especially with things like nut trees. It's like the tree, those things just want to grow. You can't stop them, right? Like, yeah. um, so you learn these little tricks, um, you know, hopefully from the stuff we're sharing today. And that's just like the tipping point being like, whoa, all of a sudden I have way more than I know what to do with. You know, we can really scale this type of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, if you want to switch over to the next one. So yeah, when we're, um, when we're planting our seeds, um, air prune beds are a primary way of growing stuff. And there's a, a couple different benefits to that. So I can kind of discuss that. Um, air prune beds are awesome because they're contained. Um, I think the, the rotten factor uh, kind of comes in. Uh, you know, like I said, if we planted um, like the picture on the left is all beech nuts um, and they're all popping up. If I just planted that in the field, um, they would have gotten totally trounced. Uh, you know, I, that was my first year actually trying this stuff. I ordered a bunch of seed and either it was, I didn't learn that, you know, Saskatoon seed takes two years to germinate if it's dried, whoops, or, you know, <laughs> like the 50 walnuts that I ordered or whatever. It's like, oh yeah, you put them in the ground. Uh, you know, squirrels can smell that if it was at the bottom of the lake. So you know, they went and dug it up. And with the air prune beds, it's like they can't get in through the sides. Um, and if you lay out hardware cloth, like quarter inch hardware cloth on top, um, you can get away with fall planting. Um, and I put quarter inch hardware cloth on the bottom. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. There's not just one right way to build an air prune bed. Um, they're definitely gaining popularity. So, you know, taking what I say with a grain of salt, knowing that like, you know, if that's just not in the cards for you to build it that deep, don't worry about it. Don't build it two feet deep. You know, um, you can build them six inches deep. Obviously the deeper you build them, the better, but there is a point of diminishing returns where it's just, it's so much soil that you have to make yeah. um, that you might as well just do it in a shallow bed. You get a bunch of stuff started in a contained place and then you grow them out in nursery beds the next year, right? It might take yeah. two years, but you got 80 oaks out of a 15 inch by 15 inch little flat. Yeah. Um, well, the, and the, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you, uh, Brian was, um have you seen anybody because I, I like how you've got these little like two foot by two foot or, or whatever they are 15 by 15 yeah. things um have you seen anyone doing anything with to make air prune beds out of like five gallon buckets or yeah. um anything like that where it's you know stuff that people already has that you can you can really get some depth to how much sure. solar will get you know a lot in a in a small space yeah milk crates um okay. who i think it's uh, I think Mark Shepard does that actually. Okay. Uh, cool. Yeah. And it's like, you want to get them off the ground. Um, you can see the, the middle picture there. It's, it's raised off the ground. Um, that's great, but it also, um, here's a, a, a million dollar tip. That thing will be frozen probably through the end of April, you know? Um, um, yeah. So it's like, if you're expecting to get things, you know, when hazels are germinating in March, and you're like, cool, my air prune bed's above ground. It's too big to have been, you know, moved anywhere. So it had to stay where it was. Yeah, so yeah. now it's like the only beds like that, I, or the only species I grow in beds like that are walnuts because they germinate so late. 
And then I learned that I can actually get away with planting hazels in the field in the spring after they've stratified in a bucket. And even then it's kind of a gamble, but I'll put row cover over them so that it's not just easy pickings for the stellar gaze and the squirrels um, and overplant it. Cause if they take, you know, 80, there's 600 in the bed, they can have it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, using recycled materials, um, all the wood we use is slab wood from a local mill. Yeah. So, you know, they don't have to be pretty. Um, I, man, the first air prune bed I built, I didn't do it right. Um, it collapsed. And then I realized, oh, I should, I should use pallets as the bottom, right? So yeah. you kind of see the pallet right there. Um, and, you know, we line up pallets um, and, and we use stumps, right? Sourcing the stumps was difficult because it takes a lot of stumps. And um, like I said, it froze solid. So and I was yeah. sick of using the little ones because I was like, well, I'm trying to scale this up. You know, I'm, I'm doing rows and rows of these little handmade boxes. How do I make this more efficient? And so it was pallets on the ground. Um, you build little verticals off the pallet studs and then put in slab wood for the sideboards. Um, and that is the bed on the left. And let's see, um, I'm going to look to see, there's a good picture. If you go to slide number nine, so yeah, you can see, yeah, that one works too, actually. Um, you can see all those beds right there on the left and up are, uh, those are all air prune beds that are two feet deep. And I have access to a ton of sawdust from the same mill nearby. So they just drop off sawdust and dump it. Cause if it's above ground, it's going to freeze solid. And, you know, you can take the little handheld ones, like the one you see on the right there. Um, and you can plant them and screen the top. And then as long as you mulch the sides with wood chips or, you know, sawdust or whatever it is, the, the flat won't freeze solid and the seeds will feel like they're just planted in the ground. But if I were to leave that flat just on the ground over the winter, even in our mild winters in the Kootenays here, uh, none of those seats make it, right? So, okay. um, yeah, that picture on the left is, uh, that's a lot of sawdust we moved. And you definitely want to be careful with sawdust because you create a crazy environment for rodents. Um, but that's, uh, you know, as long as they're insulated, then it's like, cool, Those that's my fall planting fleet of air prune beds. Um, and it really took, yeah, you can use that photo too, actually, the sewing one that it took a lot of, uh, time and effort to make all the soil, build the beds, but you know, once they're there, they'll last, I mean, we have beds that are over five years old now that are doing just fine. Um, so, you know, they really serve their purpose and you can get so many trees started in them. Um, you can kind of see, you know, to segue into that, like, how densely do I sow these perennial seeds? Um, they can grow really tight, especially in the air prune bed. Because the other benefit is that because the screen, it, at the bottom is a screen of wire mesh, um, the roots go down and then they stop and air prune um, at that interface instead of, you know, like they would in a pot, they start circling and become yeah. rebound. And so that allows you to grow a lot of trees in a really tight space um, and, and get away with, you know, just planting really densely, right? So, I mean... Yeah, yeah thousands of seeds in there and you know maybe you thin it a little bit right obviously the more you thin it the bigger they'll get but um if you're trying to be economical with your soil and your space um and your time you know you can just pack them with seeds and yeah they'll grow small little trees but then you grow them out like i said in nursery beds for another year and they'll grow yeah. size for you. So, yeah yeah cool um yeah and we might as well talk about harvesting um what to do when you grow your trees successfully you, you found the trees, you put them in, you know, storage, they stratify properly, you grew them out and air prune beds are in the field and, uh, and now it's, they're ready to harvest. So, you know, we use rock forks, um, or digging forks. I definitely recommend, uh, full metal forks. I've gone through a bunch of wood handles, <laughs> um, yeah. uh, you know, Lee Valley has like some metal handle tools, um, that are good to dig with. So, you know, the roots go down, uh, especially in their field, like two feet, um, so you definitely want to loosen the soil up as much as you can around it and then pop it out, but you get to pull out these full intact root systems. Yeah. I, that's really what I stress about doing this stuff yourself versus buying, you know, stock from other nurseries that use pots, um, or plugs. Cause you're just getting this fully intact root system that, you know, you're just not going to get anywhere else. I mean, you know, we send them out, people are always just shocked at like, yeah. How big, and it's just like, oh, I thought that was normal. What do you yeah. get normally? 
Yeah. yeah. No, I get. I I actually had like a you know a, a problem planting mine just because yeah. I I wasn't prepared for it. Now that I am, I, I've I've changed my planting style. Sure. Um, so I can I can you know dig deep enough holes to get that full root system in there. Right. But yeah. You know, normally from you know the the like tree time, like the kind of wholesale nurseries that you get from, you know, you'll get a, a two foot tall you know stem above the ground, yeah. and the plug will be six inches. Totally. And yeah. It, yeah. And I mean, you can you can expand that out to like you know uh, a six foot tall apple tree that's grown right. even you know in a big ass pot, and it's like great, and they tell you you're going to get fruit the next year. And you very well might because it's, you know, it's a grafted tree. It's that old. It's just, it's time for it to produce, but it has this really inferior root system and it's going to be way more susceptible to disease and pest. And, you know, five years from now, you could put in a one or two year old apple seedling or a grafted little apple yeah. and it's going to catch up, you know, over yeah. time. Well, and that's something I wanted to ask you, um, Brian, I know I'm skipping ahead to the to questions here, but um, so one of the like one of the theories that I have is like I, I don't believe that weeds or pests are out to get us or that they're they're there to you know yeah. uh, like I don't believe in invasive species um, even diseases in human beings I've, I've talked to this on other live streams and so my following that line through which I've it's, I've seen that that principle hold true in every other aspect of agriculture I'm wondering is a lot of these pest diseases like the plum curculio and you know apple rust and the the chestnut blight and all these things are are those diseases um kind of the uh, uh partially due to how these things are have been have been propagated on a mass scale and and can you speak to you know some of the trees that you've seen grown you know more in accordance with their their you know biological um conditions are, are are they more adapted to to uh, and and yeah, are they affected by these pests and diseases? Like, yeah, it's it's a great observation. I mean, when I'm, you know, a lot of it, you're just like it's fertilized with neglect. How is it doing this? Like, no one's cared for this tree. <laughs> like, and there is a lot of there's a lot to be said for you know um, letting the checks and balances of nature weed things out. You know. So I, I think it's an astute observation. I mean, there's, you know, with things like the chestnut blight, that's, you know, there is globalist pressures where it was just a fungus that evolved in Asia, made it to North America. It would never have made it over here that quickly. So, so know. have you, have you heard of Mark Shepard's theory about that? What did he say? Yeah. He, yeah. he said that, that when, when um, Europeans got to North America and they stopped the burning cycles, Sure. That's that's where the blight started to come in because those yeah. species were adapted to periodic burning by the indigenous people. Yeah. And when that was stopped, um, I think he said it was it was due to it changed some balance in the soil. Maybe it was sure. um, a potassium. Uh, right. There just wasn't enough of it. And uh -huh. um, anyway, yeah. So I, that, I I I don't know if it's that's yeah. true or not. But like I said, if every other aspect of disease or, or weed that I've I've looked into for any other thing. It's yeah. always it's, they're they're not there as a bad guy. They're there actually to help and to to either you know they're they're kind of nature, nature's garbage collectors to get yeah. rid of the old stuff so the new stuff can come, or in a lot of cases, um, they're actually there to help repair the damage that's being done. And yeah. they're seen as as a, the the thing that's causing the sickness. Totally, and I mean just just in my experience of like. Well, which of these, you know, perennial crops have the most, you know, pest and disease pressure? And it's the rosaceae family, you know, pears, yeah. apples, plums, cherries, because yeah. they're so, they're, you know, it's not overbreeding. Uh, there's so many cool cultivars and, the, you know, the genome of that family is, is incredible. But it's like we focus so hard from an orchard standpoint, from a commercial orchard standpoint, and the diversity in our diet's gone down so much that it's just, you know, they, we grow the heck out of these things. Whereas like, you're not going to see a lot of disease on sea berry, right? Because it's not a commercial crop. There haven't been a million different varieties and yeah. kind of these trees in everybody's backyard. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, walnuts are fascinating because like English walnuts, I'm not sure they're, they're positive of where the actual origin is because the, the crop has been grown so many places all around the world. I mean, probably China somewhere. Um, 
but yeah, you're just looking, it's like the wildness in the genetics um, and the diversity is a good thing. And so when we're talking about the uncertainty of what you're going to get, that's the built-in mechanism to keep things fresh, right? To, to not have redundancy that, you know, it's not a defect of, a, you know, the same apple tree to get disease, right? It, the disease is showing us that we need more diversity. Um, so yeah, that's good. Great slide to show, uh, you know, there's, there's so many different things you can grow so many non-traditional, you know, fruits, berries, and nuts. Um, and if they don't feed you, they'll feed an the animal. There's, there's always a reason to, to try something new. So yeah, I just, I, I see it. I, you know, when I see these trees that I collect from and they're just, they're not watered, it's the drought of the century and they're just cranking out crops. And it's just like, man, we've been lied to about all this stuff that we have to do. And it's not exactly that simple, right? Um, yeah. And by all means, you know, when you're getting small seedlings established, water them, right? Like give them some care. But there is a point where it's like, if you don't have enough diversity in your system and you're caring for it too much, it creates weakness and and yeah. you need you need that stuff to show itself. Yeah. Well, and actually there was someone who um, uh, had a question here that kind of, uh, Touches on that is is curious about using Mark Shepard's stun type method, which um, it's an acronym he developed that means sheer total utter neglect. Yeah, um, he said if if I dropped you know, three thousand native seeds in onto the soil, would I achieve twenty five percent germination? Yeah, um, you might the first time you did it. Um, I remember uh, something Akiva Silver said in podcast was just like, you know, your first couple of years of growing tree crops from seed, like the animals in your area haven't been keyed on to the fact that you're doing this <laughs> go for it, you yeah. know, but if you go in a couple of years and you find out or they, they find out that you're just hand bombing a bunch of acorns in the landscape, like you're <laughs> going to get spanked. You're going to get zero percent germination. Yeah. So, um, and you know, one of the first conversations we had um, when we first met was like, you're like, man, I'm so sick of trying to plant thousands of trees, even if they're small, like, you know, yeah. Is there a way we could direct seed this stuff? Yeah. And I think there is. I just don't know if we've developed the methods to do it because, you know, all those pressures that we talked about and requirements to get these perennial plants to germinate, you know, it's not winter or I, you can't just stick it in a, in a grain drill. Um, but there's, there's gotta be ways to do this. So. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm working on and I'm, I'm trying to start with, you know, easier species like, you mentioned like the maples or you know, basically any of the, the species in my environment that are the weeds that are just growing in the ditches. Yeah. Um, I, I'm trying to start with those ones first and, um, and, uh, and see if I can start to actually direct seed something yeah. to my, my food forest grows this year. So. Totally. And I mean, yeah, just to, to kind of put a cap on that conversation but leave you get with wanting more Our my friend, uh, Forrest McCormick, uh, you know, he's putting on like one of the biggest agroforestry, you know, plantings in the Kootenays, probably in Western Canada at this point. And, you know, we were chatting the other day and he's like, yeah, I'm thinking about all these extra acorns I got. And I think I'm just gonna, you know, take a, you know, a, a shank and, you know, rip up a bunch of soil in a line and just plant them every eight feet. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, they're already stratifying, they're already germinating. Yeah. So the the time of, of pest pressure is going to be greatly reduced because they've, they've done all that. They're going to be popping out of the ground in a month. Yeah. And yeah, you know, thinking through it, I think it's totally possible, especially with the bigger woody species. But, um, you know, how do you get some of the smaller stuff to go? And we were talking about it and it's kind of like uh, the, the crux is identification because you're going to say if you yeah. put an acorn every 10 to 15 feet and then in between you're just – you know, cover cropping essentially with all these different woody perennial Saskatoons, different berry bushes, right? The, the yeah. support species. Um, and then it's like, okay, then they come up. Are you going to be able to tell which seedling is a lamb's quarter versus a mulberry? You know, with experience in the nursery, you definitely will be. And then it might be just a matter of, you know, okay, the spring's hit, these things have germinated and you're out there with a little wing hoe on a quarter mile row making those selections and mulching the rest. Um, and you only do that one time, right? You just get them established. And now, and then it's like, okay, maybe your field has deer protection or whatever it is, but you just established, you know, thousands of trees pretty much for free. 
on scale, right? So, yeah. you know, we're theorizing this stuff. Um, it might be our generation, it might be the next generation that really puts this stuff into practice. Um, but the door is wide open, man. It's there's a lot to be explored um, yeah. to get big living systems going. Yeah. And this is what a lot of the guys in the subtropics um, where, you know, where, where Syntropy uh, was was first developed. This is what they're doing is everything is started from seed right. uh, directly in the ground. And they're, yeah, they're putting stuff, you know, inches apart. <laughs> yeah. The seed and then, and then basically letting the natural selection take place in the row. Right. Um, and then thinning as, as things get into, into production. Yeah, totally. And I mean, that's, that was my big takeaway from Mark Shepard's, you know, approach for his, his, uh, stun method. And, you know, there's always kind of, you know, you're always function stacking, you know, with permaculture systems. And if you plant chestnuts at five foot spacing and your eventual goal is to have trees at like, you know, 15 foot centers, well, you have, you got to choose the best tree. And then the other two trees that didn't make it, well, maybe it took six, seven years to make that decision. But then you have two epic mushroom logs, you know, yeah. so there's still a yield there. Yeah. And you're going through this mass breeding project. Um, so, you know, you're kind of just you're like, all right, what can I still get? I'm not wasting my time. It's just, it's a bigger arc of, of selection that you got to do. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I, I know you've got a couple, you've got two slides left here. Let's wrap that up. We've got a bunch of great questions and uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, you know, that's a nice way to, to go into that is just how much potential there is in, in genetic uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. um, there is no perfect tree. Um, we, you know, in this space, we kind of want things to go well. We want to do it right the first time and not have to repeat ourselves. But if we kind of, you know, change our mindsets up and just go, well, I'm just going to go for it. And I'm going to go for it again. And you know, really live that mantra of like, you know, a green thumb isn't someone who's just inherently good at growing plants. A green thumb is someone who's killed a bunch of plants, but not given up. <laughs> right. And that's, that's evolution in a nutshell, right? It's not expecting it to get it right every single time. Um, and you know, the, if you have a thousand chestnuts, you know, there's going to be the perfect chestnut in there somewhere, but you don't get to know which one. And you're going to have to be patient about it. So I think kind of just, you know, you know, kind of zooming back out and it's just like, well, how does, how do I treat my property this way? You know, it's just not have, you know, having plans, but not having them so rigid that you can't be flexible and building in that time for observation, you know, over the arc of, of time to be like, yeah. I'm going to just try this out. And when it yeah. doesn't work out, I'm not going to be afraid to just kill that thing and put something else in. Yeah, ab absolutely. And just to like, I want to stress this again is like, that's what that is why I put you know, my century beds, you know, literally 10 feet from my front door. Yeah, is because this is my laboratory. Like I, I fully expect that half of the things that I put in are going to die, or I'm going to cut them out because I don't want them. Um, but that's part of my strategy in the next two to three years. Um, I'm going to learn so much about what's going to do really well on my new property, even though I've, you know, I've, I already have some experience in growing fruit trees. Um, the, so I, I really encourage people to, to do that. Like, like Brian's saying is, is, um, you know, know that some of the stuff's going to, you're going to make mistakes. Like last year I put a banana, there was a, a banana plant. Um, it was like an indoor one. But as I'm buying stuff for my nursery, they had one of these. It's like, what the hell? I'm going to throw this in just to see what it does. It, oh. didn't, do, it didn't even, you know, grow anything basically the whole <laughs> summer. Um, but, uh, you know, the other day I saw like uh, uh, sugar cane, like, like stubs, like in the, in the grocery store. So it's like, oh, totally. I'm going to grab some of those. I'm going to throw some of those in the ground. Yeah, yeah. And again, I, I have no idea. Like, I, I've no, uh, I don't think they're going to make it through the winter, but who knows if that sugar cane is going to grow, you know, five, six feet in the first, you know, summer that produces a bunch of biomass. And then I can, you know, pull the canes out, keep them in my root cellar. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, but that was one of the things that Bill Mollison really stretched was in the, in the first, he, he kind of laid out four years to abundance was his plan. And the right. first year you started with like thousands of varieties 
And then every year you kind of reduced it by an order of magnitude. Yeah. And by year four, you had figured out, okay, these are the things that grow super well in my area. I like the way they taste. They, they work with my style of gardening. Great. On year four, that's when you start scaling everything up um, and away you go. Yeah. So, yeah. I, 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 I really encourage that, that approach for every aspect of gardening, whether it's fruit trees or vegetable gardening. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I think some people listening might, you know, find kind of contrasting ideas here in that, you know, on one hand, we're saying select stuff within your region because it's, it's adapted, it's proven. And yeah. then on another hand, uh, and I mean, the example I can give here is uh, Buzz Ferber in Vermont, right, is, is trying to breed persimmons, a cold hardy yeah. persimmon. Um, yeah. And, you know, he's like, I'm not just going to go get the cold hardiest persimmon seed stock. I'm going to select from these choice cultivars in Indiana, even though yeah. Indiana is nowhere near the cold of Vermont. And he puts out, I think he said something around 10,000 persimmons are out there. And now he's got like a hundred growing, yeah. right? Like this is the scale we're talking about. Yeah. Um, just because it's not from your area or proven to be cold hardy doesn't mean you shouldn't try doing it. Now he's a plant breeder at that scale, maybe you don't have that same capacity on an urban lot somewhere, but you know, I, you know, all my customers that are buying persimmons, like it's right there in the description, like this is experimental, right? Like persimmons are not a proven crop in Canada. Like unless you're on Vancouver Island in the tropics over there, like, you know, it's a, yeah. it's, it's a gamble. And I think that's totally okay. I think we've been kind of fed this, you know, diet of, of surety our whole yeah. lives when it comes to some of this stuff. And it's, it's okay for it to be wrong. My whole goal was just like, well, that persimmon shouldn't cost you 150 bucks. It should be like a $20. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. 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 <laughs> so. well, and it's like, that's, it's such a great, good way of putting it. It's like, I, I don't buy lottery tickets. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I don't go to the casino, but uh, the way that I, I get my kind of kicks is by, <laughs> you know, buying stuff that's two or three, zones outside my my growing zone and seeing if it's going to work because totally. that would be like winning the lottery if if i can get a you know a cold hardy mulberry or a honey locust that's going to yeah. grow well and produce fodder seeds like that is an absolute game changer yeah no that's and that's it and i mean whether you own land or not it's like you know i want to inspire people to just start you know breeding orchards or you know plantings get your municipality behind it get your school behind it right put something in where it's just like, we're going to, we're going to flood with a bunch of different diversity of genetics. If it doesn't make it, well, we're not like a commercial farm here. It's okay. And you know, what could be left in the future is, is something really special. Cause I know the trees that I collect from in my area, like, you know, there's one major bur oak that I collect from in Kamloops. And that certainly wasn't like the only bur oak that was planted there. But it's one of the only bur oaks that have lived to a hundred years and still produces these big crops. So, yeah, yeah. you know, we it takes a thousand failures to find that big success. But then once you find that success, you know, we have, you know, we're the species that shares information. We tell stories, right? And these stories are found in the plants themselves. So, yeah, um, super exciting, man. I like to be totally. part of it. Totally, yeah. It's it it just gives me goosebumps thinking about the the stuff and. Cool. Okay. Uh, do you want to dig in some questions here? Yeah, totally. Okay. So um, we've got one here. Um, do you have some tips for efficient management of a home nursery with 1,500 trees in, in pots? Uh, and, and how do I make sure all the containers get water if I set up a sprinkler system for watering? Oh, man. That's like my biggest nightmare. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, at our, our nursery, I do nothing in pots. I think I had... 30 or 40 things potted up the first year yeah. and it was just a nightmare to keep them irrigated because they're above ground. They dry out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You can, you can, first of all, you can bury your pots. That's a pretty common practice in nurseries that do have pot culture. Um, so digging a trench, hopefully you have a little tractor or uh, you know, uh, excavator you can dig a trench with and submerge the pots. You know, I think maybe the roots will come out of the bottoms or whatever, but not too bad. So keep them, keep them insulated from temperature fluctuations and for irrigation, I mean, 1500 pots, like, I don't know, you can't necessarily do, you know, spot drip with you know, a single emitter per pot. Uh, mm -hmm. 
you're going to sprinkle the heck out of them and you're going to have a big problem, you know, with either super dry or super waterlogged pots. And I get why people use pots, right? It's, it's contained, right? You can move it around. Um, I think it, it, it's not the greatest idea. Um, you know, things like vegetables, you can get away with pots, things with these big root systems. Um, you know, if it's a, if it's more than a two foot tree, that would take a 30 gallon pot, you know, to really encompass that root, um, structure in, yeah. we'll call it the wild. Right. So, um, just kind of, yeah, I, I want to give them some usable advice, but I don't know. Use sprinklers, bury them, insulate them next year. Yeah. Don't use any pots. That's great. Uh -oh. This is a, a good question here. Uh, Brian, uh, Zero Fox Tree Crops, do tell. Where does the name come from? Yeah, this guy's got a sense of humor too. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. We were searching for names. I'm not. Uh, I'm never going to name something after myself. I'm not that yeah. type of guy. And uh, um, I don't know. I saw all these, and not just in the nursery industry, but just kind of in permaculture in, in general. Is there's all these like whimsical, like, you know, sage and sedge and you know, uh, like the sacred circle, you know, whatever. And I just, I, I was like, I'm not going to go that route. So uh, I was on a ski trip with some buddies um, and, you know, we were sitting around and he's, he said a joke. He's like, it'd be hilarious if a farm was called Zero Fox Farms. <laughs> I was like, that rhymes with tree crops. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think on a more serious note, it kind of embodies what we were talking about. Like, I don't want, finicky genetics. I don't want to sell something that is so specific and has all these requirements. I mean, plants are what they are, but I want something that's resilient. I want something that, you know, doesn't care about being too cold or too hot and, and demonstrates those qualities of resilience. So um, it has a lot to do with that. There's a little write up at the bottom of our footer on our website. You can kind of see some of the reasons I gave. Um, but yeah, I think one of the primary ones was just not to take ourselves too seriously and have some fun with it. So, yeah. But if every time, uh, you know, uh, Chris and Kevin, the guys, the guys that uh, um, work here at, at building your, with me at building your homestead, every time we say your name, we, we giggle. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, I bet like I had a, like an older like grandma type uh, come pick her plants up from the farm and she just, she shows up and she's just like, you know, I was wondering what your name came from, and then my granddaughter told me what it meant. I just laughed, and I, I love that. I was just like, all right. And if you don't like it, then we're not for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, uh, another question here. We've got, uh, is it hard to start hazelnuts from seed? I've started apricots from seed successfully twice, but have had zero luck getting hazel, hazelnuts. Uh, is there a specific technique? Yeah, definitely. Uh, good job on getting the apricots to start because sometimes that's not easy. I know you have to crack the kernel sometimes. But uh, with hazelnuts, these are one of the plants that are really susceptible to drying out. Um, so, you know, even if you are able to harvest the nut uh, while it's still on the tree, but it's browning, it might be past the point of uh, hitting that stage where it's going to go doubly dormant, for, which means it just won't come up the next year. So there's a good chance the hazelnuts that didn't come up for you were going to come up the following year. We don't all have that kind of time allowance. Um, so when you go to collect your hazels for seed, uh, pick them pretty green. Um, basically the test to do, and this is a good advice too, to get them as soon as they're viable because the squirrels will just wipe out a crop. I mean, often the squirrels in this area will start eating the hazels before they're even viable. But yeah. um, if you go to the husk and you can, uh, you can, pop the nut out with your thumb. They don't need to be brown. They can be fully green. Um, but if the, the nut can loosen from the cap, then it's ready to plant. And so at that point, it's like harvest your seed. Um, don't worry about husking them. I put them into the buckets with their husks on, but just keep them fresh, right? Get them stratifying and essentially be, you know, hazels come out at the beginning of August or mid August you're getting essentially a warm stratification by packing them into a wet sand bucket, you know, layering them in there and then storing them outside just so animals can't get to them and they're protected, but still experiencing the background, you know, climate. Um, that's, that's a, a super important. I've had hazelnut crop failure, had to wait two years because the whole batch of seed had dried out too much. So yeah, I think yeah. that's, and um, you don't need to air prune those. They have pretty fibrous roots. 
So if you're not worried about a taproot, and that's something we should have mentioned, the airplane beds are great for these super taprooted species. Because like, good luck getting a walnut out of a garden bed. You're going to sever the roots, um, <laughs> which is really bad for a taprooted species, right? So yeah, yeah. We had to. I had to add that in for why we do the airplane beds. But hazels can go straight into a field. It's just hard to protect them out there. So stratify them in a bucket, and then you know monitor them in March. And as soon as you start seeing the seeds split get them planted out in, in your nursery beds um, and they'll pop up, but you still, you can, you can put row cover over them. Uh, not for frost protection, but for pest protection. Yeah. Okay. Brian, what do you think is the most underrated edible tree or shrub? In yeah. In a cold climate. Well, and definitely in North America, we need to give currants more love. Um, you know, the Europeans would be shaking their fingers at us being like, you guys should be going way harder on currants, <laughs> uh, especially in Canada. I mean, you know, these are like, I recommend black currant for people, you know, in the Yukon, right? So um, yeah. I think currants are, are super underrated. Uh, let's see what else. Um, the different types of walnuts, you know, it's not just English walnut. There's, there's a lot of different species um, and there's hybrids. So whether it's heart nut or, you know, the hybrid Bart nut, which is a hybrid between the hard nut and the butternut and black walnuts. I mean, the amount of breeding that's been done in English walnuts is exhaustive, right? It's been going around the world for thousands of years. Black walnuts are relatively unbred. Um, and there's a huge amount of potential with them in agroforestry, right? Uh, the guy from the Forest Garden podcast, I think just had his paper published on intercropping black walnuts with uh, cereal grains like rye so um that's oh, something to look forward to um yeah. yeah if i can if any other crops come to mind i'll definitely i'll definitely mention them yeah sure. yeah well and it it kind of there's there's another question um kind of along that same lines which was where did it go here? But yeah. What, what are your thoughts about using, you know, past solar greenhouses or other kind of microclimate effects to, to try to get, you know, planting tropical trees like figs, bananas, oranges, papayas in our climate? Yeah. Um, I can just kind of give some anecdotal story. Uh, Jerome Ossentowski uh, made, or he wrote a book called The Forest Garden Greenhouse. And if that's your goal is to grow oranges and papayas in a place they just absolutely should not be, uh, check that book out. The guy's growing all, all those plants at 3,000 meters in uh, Basalt, Colorado, and on the side of a mountain, man. It's, it's incredible. He's in a super sunny climate, so I don't know if he could necessarily apply everything, but he developed a climate battery to where it's, you know, essentially using passive solar to charge the, uh, the growing beds with the, you know, the ambient air and then it's stored, it dumps all that heat into the soil beds and uh, he gets away with like, you know, he's growing papaya at this elevation and he heats the thing with a uh, sauna, you know, on 10 of the coldest nights of the year. Otherwise it's all climate mm -hmm. battery stuff. So you can cool. do it. Um, that would be epic, you know, maybe on a, a homestead front. Okay. I'm, I'm interested in like staple crops and no, even if you can get a banana to grow in Canada, is it really going to feed populations? Is it going to feed your family? Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's a novelty and, you know, I'm just, I'm boringly practical. I mean, you can talk to my family about it. If it doesn't have some kind of like functional use, it's just aesthetic. I'm, I'm, I'm out. Yeah. Um, so I could, I could use some more, uh, artistic creativity and, and all that, I guess. But, um, you know, you can do it. Um, I wouldn't count. I wouldn't put so much. I would do that after you have a lot of other yeah. systems established. Yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of where I want to touch on it with, with that other question of like, what's the most underrated, you know, edible tree or shrub. Like when I, when I first got into like food foresting was kind of my, was my gateway drug into permaculture and regen egg and, and all this other cool stuff. And I was so like enamored with like all the tropical and subtropical stuff. Cause that's where a lot of the research and the systems that are decades old. And like, you know, you can literally put a, like a mango seed in the ground and, yeah. you know, a, a year later you eat mangoes. I get, they're just, it's a totally different climate. And I just, yeah. um, I was kind of depressed that like, Oh, we can't do that here. But the more I've got into it, 
Um, there are so many amazing varieties of, of particularly berries in our climate yeah. that are just so underrated. Um, and, you know, like, I, I think I'm growing like 30 some different varieties of, of different, you know, berries and apples and pears and plums and stuff. And that, yeah, the, the taste that you get out of these is, is just to die for and they do well. And so yeah, I, I want to, want to echo that too, of like, it's super cool. If, if I ever win the lottery, I'm absolutely going to build a forest garden greenhouse. Yeah. But, um, yeah. D don't, uh, don't underestimate, underestimate how many amazing things we can grow and that will, will thrive with, yeah. with zero Fox. <laughs> That's right. And then on that, uh, aronia berry is a really good one. Cause, okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I haven't planted that. Okay. Yeah. We'll get you some this year. I'll put some okay. in the package. Um, it's an epic, it's, I mean, it's basically a blueberry bush and the type of berry it produces and you know, how much it can yield. Um, they're unfairly called choke berry, not choke cherry, choke berry. Yes. Yeah. They're super astringent. There's cultivars that are less astringent. They're sweeter. Um, it's medicinal, man. It's, you can make wines with it. You can make vinegars with it. I mix it with other fruits to make a jelly. Uh, one of the best things you can do with it is hot sauce. And it, you know, it grows a berry that's more nutrient dense than the blueberry, but doesn't, it's not so finicky that it requires an exact, you know, low pH soil. It just grows, you know, it's a riparian plant. Uh, it grows on stream sides. Um, it's native to the Eastern part of uh, Canada and North America. So, uh, aronia berry. Yeah. I come to think of it, you, you did send me some last year and I, I did, I did put them in. I, I think I've got five, five or 10 of them. And so I'll, I'm hoping, Hopefully they will uh, they will survive. So yeah, sweet. Okay, uh, yeah. Let's let's get a few qu more questions here in here before we um, before we sign out. That's another good one here. Actually, that this was um, I, I wanted to get your your comment. It was more of a comment on this. It's like the the cherry belt in British Columbia just suffered a hundred percent bud kill during the cold snap this year. Um, it's like what, yeah, do you yeah. have any, how, how can that be avoided in the future, giving, given the, the strategies that we've been talking about tonight? Totally. And, you know, we, so the assumption there is that every cherry is not going to produce fruit. And I mean, we'll see, I'll definitely find out because, uh, we collect a couple different types of cherries, but, um, my guess is some of the non-king cherries are still going to be loaded with fruit this year. Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. And so yeah, it was yeah. the sweet cherries, the sweet cherries. Yeah, totally. So, and that's where it's just like, I'm not saying don't grow sweet cherries on your property, but it's, it's diverse, you know, um, like there's a good thing. Structural diversity is biodiversity, right? So a, a non-king cherry is much shorter. Um, it also has, you know, different branches or it, it's more of a shrub than a, a tree. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's, it's whole structure is completely different. And, uh, yeah. and also it's buds are probably a lot more cold hardy and a lot less susceptible to waking up during, I mean, while the cherries are going to be defunct this year is because uh, we had such a warm snap in February and yeah. it woke everything up. Right. That's yeah. from a plant that's not anywhere from here, or a similar climate. So yeah, it, it could be bad for the commercial uh, growers, but I'm guessing some of the, the non-kings still do it. Same with like the American plum that we grow. I mean, it's not the biggest plum. It's not the sweetest plum. It's got thorns on it. And I love it for all those reasons because, you know, it can get toppled by a bear and still send up, you know, new shoots. Um, it has thorns on it to keep the deer away. The flowers are way more frost resistant um, and later in the spring. So, you know, all these adaptations that you would expect out of a cold climate um, prunus species, where it's like, you know, if we just stick with grafted stuff, you're going to, you're going to get shut out some years because of that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, Brian, in closing, any, uh, any final thoughts to impart with people um, as they are going to head out and, and try to start their own nurseries or, or plant their food for us? It's coming here. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd say, you know, whatever's holding you back, just go for it. I mean, you know, you don't you keep it simple. Uh, try it the, the you know, most stun Mark Shepard method you can in the beginning. 
And if you get nothing out of it, then, well, it, it was probably not that big of an investment to begin with. Um, you know, go for it, right? There's there's so much abundance around us. Uh, you know, I don't own land. I've never, you know, the, the trees that I've planted are at friends' places. You know, we have a couple at our lease plot. And, man, the trees grow fast. Like, uh, you know, that kind of be the other thing I'd say is that, you know, a lot of people are worried about, you know, Oh, it's just going to take a lot longer. Maybe I should just buy something that's bigger and we'll produce sooner. But, uh, you know, the, the mentor guy that's been teaching me about this, he's not a permaculture guy at all. He, he collects trees like the way people collect, I don't know, rose bushes or something. He just loves trees. Right. Yeah. And now it's like he planted, he started planting a cup lock in the seventies and, uh, man, to go to, if I ever get a chance, I got to take you to this guy's place. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Every temperate, like, perma, like like every temperate tree species all star so like all the different kinds of oaks and all these crazy maples and you're walking with him through his block and you know you start realizing you're like he planted every single one of these trees most of which he started from seed yeah and the dude is just fretting over he's like oh i gotta which tree do i take down i put them so close you know good problems to have and it was just, you know, I'm young and just so enthusiastic where I'm like, this yeah. is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And he's sitting there being like, this is my, you know, <laughs> I don't want to have to make these decisions. But like his his quote that I just took away is just like, you will be, you know, he's like, do you want the good news or the bad news? He's like, oh, give me the good news. And it's like in regards to planting trees from seeds, like they all came up. You want the bad news? They all came up. <laughs> you're gonna have to find something to do with all the trees that you're gonna grow and they're gonna yeah. grow way faster than than you'd expect so yeah um, yeah we're just you know we live a fast-paced lifestyle we want you know a fully mature productive food forest right off the bat and uh it's okay that things you know start slow it's okay that you know that your tree only gets a couple inches of growth you don't need to douse it with fertilizers it's, it's it's growing at the pace that it's meant to. Um, and, you know, with love and the right care, that can be faster. Put it in a systems thinking context, that can be faster. But um, you're going to have more trees than you know what to do with really quick. So uh, yeah. just go for it because, yeah, there's no better way to learn than just plant a seed and seeing what comes up. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's few things that have been more meaningful in my life than planting through or walking through – uh, uh, you know, a, a shelter belt or, you know, some of the older food forests that I've planted and, and it feels like a forest. There's yeah, nothing else compares to that. Yeah. So, uh, so um, yeah, I guess b before we close off, Brian, just to tell people a bit more about Zero Tree Fox, what you do, um, how people can, can yeah buy from you. Yeah. All the kind of details. Yeah, we'll, we'll do the plugs. Um, so everything's on our online store. Um, you can see what we got left. Everything that's available is on the website. Uh, I'm actually about to update the website with some more pawpaws because we made a trade with a grower in Ontario, and I think we'll have 50 more on the website. So you said pawpaws? Yeah, pop pop -paws? yeah <laughs> we got we got pawpaws, man. I don't know about yeah. an Alberta experiment, but hey, you don't you don't you don't know? Okay, I'm. Because I've, I've, I've been wanting, there's a guy in Ontario that says he's got some that will grow in zone three. So Oof, what a claim. I mean, yeah. yeah, I think it's the same thing. Like plant them out. These are seedlings. So we should throw a couple in your pack just to see. If, yeah. well, if, if you have any seeds, um, I, would love, I would love to plant just the seeds from, uh, from starting. Yeah. That, that would be, that's basically our, our uh, cold climate mango. So yeah, totally. And um, yeah, so everything on our website is there. Um, we have a couple deals right now. Uh, if you use the promo code SPRING, that's SPRING with all capital letters, it's 10% uh, off and two free hazelnuts with your order. And uh, we just put on uh, free shipping for any of our packages. So I uh, did a bunch of pre-assembled like food force packages. Um, and then there's the custom package that you're on right now. Okay. And uh, that's kind of just to pick your own because I yeah. did not figure out how to program in drop down menus where you select different plants. So you just check out the custom package maker and um, you'll see the plants that are eligible. You pick like eight to 10 varieties and there'll be a couple of each variety in there for you know pollination purposes. Um, and we have free shipping on all, all food forest packages. So, okay. um, and you know, what I'd say is just if you're wondering about stuff, um, shoot me a message, give me a call. I like chatting with people. Um, 
you know, I'm all over the place because it's spring and we're doing all the things at once. So maybe email is best, but uh, yeah, get in touch. Cause like, I think uh, people's questions are where I learn how to, you know, be better at this and, and for what to try next. So um, yeah, check us out, follow us on Instagram or just under our farm name, zero Fox tree crops. And uh, yeah, we'll be putting out more blog posts and, um, you know, interacting with the community. We might have some workshops later in the year, but uh, yeah, awesome. that's where you can find our stuff. I hope to chat with you again sometime soon, Dakota. I think we got other topics we can get into, eh? Yeah, absolutely, man. So yeah, all, all the links that that Brian talked about tonight, they're uh, they're down in the show notes below. Make sure you check that out. Make sure I think you you have a you you got a newsletter list. Make sure you sign up for that so you can stay up to to snuff with all this stuff. I know you sold out super fast last year, um, so I'm I'm shocked that you still have stuff right now. <laughs> um, so make sure you guys get on that. And it, it is, it's fantastic stuff. I've bought from, I think I've got from you for th three years now. So yeah, this will be your third, three year game. Yeah, stuff. and I'm just always blown away by the quality and um, just beautiful stuff. Appreciate yeah. it. Brian, thanks so much for what you're doing, man. This is, uh, I think there's one of my favorite, um, well, there's, there's two of my favorite quotes uh, that I love about, about kind of trees and stuff. One of them is, you know, they say that the best underplanted tree um, was 20 years ago, but the second best time is, is today. And yeah. the other one is uh, a society grows, uh, becomes great when old men and women plant trees under whose shade they will, they will never sit. That's I right. I love that. And I think that that's what gets me so jazzed up about, about the, the, the stuff that you're doing and the experimentation. It's, it's truly inspiring, man. So thanks for helping us build a better society. Heck yeah, man. You hold, you hold a tree seed, you're holding a forest in your hand. Yeah, so true. Okay. Take care, man. Have a good night. Take care.